Okay. All right, we're going to move right into our featured panel for today. Uh, this is the, the, um, uh, the centerpiece for the conference, and I'm so very pleased um, to have uh, Peter Shea here as the moderator of this panel. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, to you um, uh, Evie Cummins. I'm not going to say anything, but just to, as you can join Peter up on stage, Evie Cummings, uh, Tony Picciano, and David Wiley. The topic for the session this, uh, this afternoon is the future of online education. I think uh, incredibly uh, timely. Um, uh, this conference is planned um, many, many months in advance, and um, I keep on being struck by the fact of how timely everything is that we're talking about in this, uh, in this conference today. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Peter. Thank you to the panelists for coming. Yep. No. But it can be. Oh, yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here. Thanks, Alex, for the invitation. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Get a little closer. Okay, I got it. We're, we're in. It's off, so uh, I want to thanks to Alex for the invitation Thank you. here and uh, very pleased that we have such an august panel to help out with this I'm gonna do I'm gonna okay okay that better okay I'll stand back okay this is a panel on the future of online learning and higher education I'm gonna do something that I never do which is read and not use PowerPoint slides um, online learning has increased access to higher education for millions of learners across the country and around the world as we know higher education is a significant predictor of a range of positive outcomes including higher employment rates higher wages more civic participation better health outcomes among many others however Higher education has undergone a steady decline in overall enrollments in recent years. I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but according to the National Student Clearinghouse, for the past six years, there's been a decline in overall undergraduate enrollments in every semester. That's 13 straight semesters of declines in overall undergraduate enrollments in the United States. So <clears throat> part of that decline is the closure of more than 100 colleges in just the last three years. In 20, since 2016, 100 colleges have closed, 175 colleges have either closed or been consolidated. So there's some things actually happening very, in very recent history. Overall, that decline might mask another shift, and it's the shift of students from for-profit and small liberal arts co colleges that have closed to public higher education. In that same period between 20, 2006 and 2012, public higher education has seen an 11% growth uh, in, in students and overall enrollment. That's according to the College Board. Another little fold in this is that much of that growth has been concentrated into uh, large-scale institutions at six states. Those six, six states include states like Texas, Arizona, and Florida that might be uh, not a surprise to anybody here. Um, and everybody who has been involved in the SUNY Online Initiative and the development of the SUNY White Paper knows that SUNY wishes to join this group of institutions that are in vastly increasing enrollments and using online learning as a lever to achieve that. So <clears throat> some very interesting trends going on in recent years, port portending a future of higher education and online learning that's a little complicated. Online learning has seen remarkable growth in recent de decades, and as Eric Fredrickson pointed out, one out of three of every college student in the United States is enrolled in at least one credit-bearing online course. That's, a, that's more than six and a half million students. Some folks have pointed out that, online, that higher education would be in greater decline, would be shrinking more rapidly if it wasn't for online learning. Uh, I think we're going to see yet another interesting tra trend as large statewide online initiatives in places like we just heard yesterday, U UMass Online with a new state initiative, SUNY with a new state initiative, California, Louisiana, Missouri, all in suggesting there will be an ongoing and perhaps increased competition for online learners. 
We know higher education faces a familiar list of challenges, shrinking budgets, changing demographics, loss of state support, public ambivalence, growing demand from employers, a shrinking full-time faculty, increasing competition from new providers, ballooning student debt, and that list probably goes on. Um, so we have a very uncertain future, I think, but uh, what we need to know is where online higher education may be learning, where it may be headed. Is online learning a solution to some of these challenges? What's the cause of the loss of enrollments in higher education overall? Will it continue? Can higher ed education innovate out of this malaise? Will higher education as we know it survive? What happens, and what about SUNY and its plans to rapidly expand online education? What are, what are other trends that are on the horizon? We have a panel of experts here today to help us predict that future. I'll just briefly introduce them. Evangeline Evie Cummings is the assistant, professor, uh, assistant provost and director of UF Online at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She's working to provide versatile access to an elite education for qualified students across the country and around the world. UF Online has seen steady growth and fairly dramatic growth, and Evie's been instrumental in strategic plans and operations that support this growth. So welcome, Evie. David Wiley is co-founder and chief academic officer of Lumen Learning, an organization dedicated to increasing student success and improving the affordability of education through the adoption of educational resources. Uh, he's also currently a Shuttleworth Fellow and an Education Fellow at Creative Commons and an adjunct faculty at Brigham Young University. So I'd like to welcome David Wiley. Thank you very much for being here, David. Tony Picciano, Anthony Picciano, has held faculty appointments in the Graduate Program in Education Leadership at Hunter College, the PhD Program in Urban Education, the Graduate Center at CUNY, and the Doctoral Certificate Program in Interactive Pedagogy at Technology at the CUNY Graduate Center. Tony is also a prolific writer and probably amongst the most highly cited researchers in the field of online learning. He's got a couple of his books here today. Uh, he's a member of the Board of Directors, a permanent member of the Board of Directors of the Online Learning Consortium and a good friend, so I'd like to welcome Tony as well to this panel. Okay, I'm tired, I'm gonna sit down, I'm done. Okay, so, I sent folks questions, some folks responded, some folks responded more than once. <laughs> we didn't get answers though. And, um, a lot of times we think about predicting the future and saying, okay, let's take out our crystal ball and predict the future. The future really depends in many ways upon the past. And I think we have with us one of the folks who has been tracking the history of online learning. Um, so Tony, can you, t to understand the present and the future, we really need to understand the hi that history. Tell me some of the key points in the history of online learning, especially maybe where online learning has not succeeded very well or very dramatically and what that tells us about the potential future of online learning. Okay. Thank you, Peter, and I'm very happy to be here. I just want to take one little aside. Uh, uh, you've heard some banter this morning between Eric and Peter and Karen and myself, and I just want to say that about 20 some odd years ago, when City University was trying to figure out what to do with online learning in around 1996, 97, and there were several administrators and faculty mucking, trying around, mucking around trying to figure out how to do this. Remember, there's no course management systems. Uh, it, the connectivity is basically just text-based and what have you. And I gave a call to um, Eric Fredrickson up at SUNY because they were about two, maybe three years ahead of us. And he invited me and I brought a colleague or two with us. And I must say that um, no one could have been more gracious, more giving of their expertise than Eric and his staff. It was Eric and Peter, Karen, Alex, and I've never forgotten that. And um, we have spent 25 years sharing knowledge and sharing experiences with each other. So I'm very grateful to you. And on the 20th anniversary of your Open SUNY Summit, I think it's, it's appropriate to recognize that. Thank you, guys. So the history of, of online learning, both its uh, pluses and not so great pluses, um, I can go back to 1960. You don't want me to go back that far, <laughs> do now. Um, I did write my first program, 1967, on an IBM 407 accounting machine. I won't go into that. But in any case, let's assume we start 
with online learning in the 1990s, although there's incredible work done in the 1950s and 60s by people like uh, Pat Supis. If any of you are familiar, I, I assume that some of the instructional designers here might have looked at his work in CAI back in the 60s. Uh, but let's start in the 1990s. And I would say one of the really important starting points was the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, the president of the foundation was somebody by the name of Ralph Gomery, who some of you may know. He was the vice president in charge of research at IBM before being president of the foundation. But even before the internet was really available, he started a program called Anytime, Anyplace Learning. And he was basically thinking of wide area networks. Some of us had wide area networks. At CUNY, we had something called BitNet, which was started between IBM, Yale, and, and City University. Those of you who had NSF Foundation, there was something called NSFNet, which, which incorporated, I think, 700 colleges at one time. Uh, but Ralph, uh, decided to fund or have the foundation fund work in any time, any place learning. And over the course of about 20 years, they don't, they see, they seeded about $70 million worth of projects. One of the important things about that was that, and some of the things that I think we here could be very proud of, while the first couple of grants were to Ivy League colleges like Cornell or, or Stanford, MIT, he quickly decided to fund a lot of the direction funded to large university systems, such as the State University of New York, University of Illinois, Chicago, some work in California, uh, University of Massachusetts, and my own institution, City University of New York. That was a very important strategic decision on their part because they wanted to move this idea of any time, any place learning to the masses. They didn't want it as something that would be a kind of a demonstration at an MIT or, an, or a Cornell. They wanted it implemented to the masses. I think that was a very important strategic decision on their part because all of a sudden you had SUNY, California, CUNY, Illinois, Massachusetts developing online, mostly in the, in the 90s. This is, these are fully online courses and quickly programs. But you have to remember at the time the software is very rudimentary. Many of us had to do our own work in either HTML or some other uh, piece of software because the course management systems were not there. And the, the connectivity was not there. You were doing everything asynchronously with text. I mean, to, to, to send even a, a photo, you had to have some decent connectivity. And most students didn't have that. So it was a very interesting time. It was like really pioneering days. And it was led by, uh, I think, uh, very importantly, by some of the publics. Uh, as well as the for-profit universities. University of Phoenix, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about them again later, but they were very important uh, uh, creators of really good pedagogical models for teaching online. I mean, they had things like uh, no class would have more than 13 students. There was interactivity. We heard, we heard Karen talking this morning about social presence. I'm not sure that they used that term then, but. They had a lot of interactivity in their courses, and so they were a good model to follow. And there were several other what would be traditional uh, distance education type schools that led the way in the 90s. Towards the latter 90s and in the early 2000s, the technology and, and what we were learning from the early stages found its way into mainstream higher education. And so, uh, many of the schools, while they continued moving ahead with fully online courses and programs, many schools started blending online learning technology into the regular classrooms. And we had this blended model where faculty were taking part of their courses, putting it online, putting other parts of the courses, and teaching it face to face. That was a very important development because it moved online learning technology out of the distance education model and into the mainstream education model. And I would presume that most of you, not most of you, many of you probably are working with a lot of faculty who are not teaching their entire course online, but they're teaching some of it online and some of it face to face. That took off really significantly in the early 2000s and continues to today. We have no idea how many blended, how many faculty are teaching blended learning and we can also say the web enhanced learning, but that's even more amorphous because we have no definitions of blended learning. What a definition of blended learning is in my institution might be different in, in your institution. We don't even use the same words, 
blended hybrid flip classes, classrooms. All of these are really talking about the same thing of some combination of online and face-to-face. -face. But all of a sudden, all this technology moved into mainstream higher education. Uh, and that was important because it wasn't done for anything to do with finances or, or, or savings in any way, shape, or form. It was done because a lot of faculty thought it made pedagogical sense that you can extend your class beyond the, the, the two-hour uh, uh, bell schedule or whatever. In 2008, we had, as much of us know, and Eric referred to it, we had the MOOC phenomena. And all of a sudden, we were seeing these courses. 160,000 students enrolled in one course. And it, was, it captured the, you know, our entire psyche in higher education. The New York Times, or one of them, it was the year of the MOOC. Massive open online courses. And there was a lot of hype associated with it. And it's my feeling, and I think maybe Eric might differ, differ with me a little bit. But a lot of the people who were developing this, I mean, Sebastian Troon at Udacity and Daphne Kohler at, at uh, Coursera, they, they started believing their own hype. But many of us had questions about it, about the pedagogical value, particularly of the early MOOCs. Yep, they went out to 160,000 students but a lot of it was video, and not particularly exciting video. A lot of it was relatively talking heads, voiceover PowerPoints. And, and, it was not, and there was that, that interaction piece was not there. That social piece was difficult to integrate into that model. And they had a couple of experiments, and, and we don't have to go into the details, but by 2013-14, the MOOC hype had ended and a lot of people just moved away from it. And to this day, the MOOC model is still popular, but not really for credit-bearing courses. It's done for a lot of other things. Now, I'm not here to bury MOOCs, because one thing they did that was very, very valuable is they brought in a lot of private capital into the design of courses. Now, I don't know what your budgets are at your schools, but I doubt that you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars to develop a course. I doubt it, maybe you are, but most schools are not doing that. But some of the companies that have now inherited a lot of the MOOC technology are doing just that. Newton just raised $25 million in capital funding to develop courses all for higher education. I think that's interesting and important. And I'm someone who in my previous life where I did, was a senior VP, for finance and administration, I think money matters. Uh, uh, and, and when you invest in something, and if you have some good people working with it, some good things can happen. So that continued through about 2013, 14. And I think we're in a, a stage right now, or a phase right now, where we are combining that blended learning pedagogical model with some of the, some of the technology much of which had to do with significant investment in design, which, by the way, among the MOOCs got much better as the years went on. We're in a combination of that blended pedagogical model and the MOOC model right now. And we've added things like adaptive learning, analytics, uh, more cloud computing than we ever had before. And I think that's where we are right now. I also tend to think that's where we're going to continue for the immediate future. Evie or David, you want to respond to any of the history of online learning and its importance for where we are headed in the future? No? no? That's great. I mean, I'll just share that I, I think I was a freshman in 1993 and showed up on campus and was told I had to get this thing called an email address. Um, so I definitely think that as a, you know, it varies by institution, kind of to what extent there was such a fantastic legacy as you've described, and I'm glad to see it spreading more systematically. Yeah, I'll just note, I think Tony raised an important issue that this long time, no, <coughs> going back to this one. I think, okay. is it local? <coughs> okay, is that one working now? Okay. Yeah. Back off. I'll note that Tony mentioned the Sloan Foundation, and I think it was $75 million that they invested in many institutions, including SUNY, as being the source of, I think, maybe not necessarily profit-driven funding, but it was an access mission that Sloan was out to uh, engender. They wanted to increase access to higher education for those folks who were willing, able, and
anyone interested in getting a higher education. Right now, I think we're in an interesting period where that Sloan Foundation money and any uninterested uh, or nobly interested <laughs> funding may not be so apparent. And I think what's replacing that is private capital from the OPMs. And a lot of folks are dependent on private capital from the OPMs. And it's an interesting, not necessarily entirely ideal scenario for everyone, but I think that may be part of the history that informs our future. Will the OPMs and the bottom line that they have shape online learning to the extent that the Sloan Foundation's funding shape that in what direction it remains to be seen. So Ivy, I'm going to move over to you. You're currently overseeing a large scale online education operation at the state of, in the state of Florida. You have online seen remarkable growth in recent years, I think in large part due to some uh, significant investment by the state of Florida mm -hmm. in ways that other states are not investing. And it's very, I think, responsible and innovative strategies on your part. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about UF Online and its current success and, and to what extent UF Online may represent a future model for online education? Sure, thanks for having me. So I'm still absorbing that you just referred to OPMs as investors. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, so, uh, so hi everybody, I'm here from Florida. The snow is incredible. Wow, it's cold. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so yeah, so I'm from the University of Florida, the Gators, Tib Tebow, Gatorade, that's us. Um, go Gators, someone doing a chomp, nice to see. Um, so we're a school of about 58,000, uh, number eight public university in the country, AAU school, Carnegie Research One, uh, and we are very fortunate to be embedded in a state that's investing. Um, I think that uh, I had my team tally it up. We, so UF Online, for all it's done, we've been uh, the recipient of about $40 million from the state of Florida. Um, we have been able to bring in $32 million in tuition revenue, um, but it is something I always uh, talk to folks about online education. It's then we drop the mic. Online education is nothing you do if you want to grow revenue. Um, so it's not something that's less expensive. Um, so some of the things that I'm going to talk about are not my accomplishments, but the accomplishments of our entire uh, campus and, of course, the state. Um, so we launched uniquely by law. So law from the state of Florida said there shall be a fully online undergraduate program at the University of Florida. It was done so to increase access to the University of Florida, the flagship institution in the state. Um, with, again, a significant investment, an initial OPM that actually made the whole launch possible, but we reached a point of maturity and we were able to go it uh, alone. I think that um, some of my perspectives on the future of online, really, uh, I think about the future in terms of it being um, quite human. Uh, so when we think about what it's going to take and, and where we're going to go, we're looking to double the number of academic advisors over the next five years, humans. We're probably going to double, double our number of instructional designers. We're going to be rising uh, our ranks of faculty, and we're probably going to be evolving our teaching model into teaching teams. Um, we're proudly working. Uh, we launched an employer pathways program uh, last year. We're working now with Disney, Walmart, and, and Discover. Um, and I get questions a lot about that, which is, oh, how did you do that, and how did it start? So I'll, can I share a brief story? Absolutely. Okay, so there I was reading the news, and I heard about Chipotle, like getting, uh, working with this company called Guild to do online education, and I was like, I'm going to Google them. Who were they? Looked them up, found Guild on LinkedIn, sent them a message, and said, hey, the University of Florida would like to be part of this. And that's how it started. 18 months later, we finally had an agreement with Walmart and Disney, and so some people think that I had some very elaborate and thoughtful multi-year strategy to engage employers for workforce needs. And I'm like, no, it was a LinkedIn love story, okay, <laughs> where I sent a message to Guild. Um, but so I think a lot of it, it's human connections, it, it's reaching out, it's making those calls. Uh, but ultimately, your online program will be local, and it will be based on your culture. Um, and I think we are fortunate to be in a state university system with 12 four-year universities. Uh, our system acts for good and not evil, and I say that with love to the system folks in the room from SUNY. Um, you know, the, the work that we are doing is made possible thanks to the system, but yet the University of Florida is able to innovate and evolve and grow in its own unique way. Okay. So you raise an eyebrow when I said OPMs are investors. <laughs> yeah, who, who else is in, 
I think in Florida, for example, you've got yeah. state investment. And in some other states, like California, you see massive state investment. But for many other states and many other institutions, the kind of upfront investment that they're going to need to grow, to scale, and to have a significant presence, especially if they're late to the game, is going to come from somebody. And it seems like the place that is ready, willing, and able to provide that funding are the OPMs. Yeah. I know you guys for had a, a price. You, yes, <laughs> you you guys had a, a a partnership with an OPM. We did, and, and I, you know, and I'll, I'm sorry. You go ask your you question. Go, you go ahead. I was going to say, uh, and again, um, I look at all of these launches of online programs as inherently temporal. There's that initial phase. So we have. I look at our program in terms of its three phases. The first two years was our initial launch, where yeah, we needed the OPM. We needed the expertise. The University of Florida has a long legacy of distance ed, but it had never done fully online undergraduate programs, certainly never done marketing um, for those programs in a holistic way. So we, we worked with Pearson, and they, they brought in a lot of expertise. Um, but then we entered our second phase, which was kind of uh, basically owning it. Uh, embracing it, turning it into our own program. And I think a lot of you can work with a lot of awesome OPMs to help you in those early stages, and then you get to know what you can do, what you still need help with, uh, and you, you shift into your next phase. And I, I think we're proudly now, so in that, in that second phase, we then, um, so I oversaw the, the launch of an on-campus marketing team, call center, all that good stuff. Um, but now we're in our third phase, which is kind of our continued expansion, and we're focused on STEM. Um, but we would never be where we are today were it not for the OPM. But I also, damn it, uh, our relationship with the OPM also came at a pretty steep price. Uh, we had a significant rev share. Most do. Frankly, they have to make money for all of their expertise that they're bringing to the table, but it just wasn't sustainable for us. Um, another thing I didn't mention about the launch of UF Online is that by law, our tuition has to be lower. So the state invests. Uh, five million dollars a year and for that our tuition must be 25 percent lower for Florida residents and actually a lot lower for out-of-state students as well so our in-state uh, Florida residents pay hundred and twelve dollars a credit hour uh, also by law we're not able to charge a distance learning fee um, out-of-state five hundred dollars a credit hour and no distance learning fee so the state really is subsidizing these lower tuition amounts um, so we've calculated, I think we've been able to save uh, students within the state of Florida about $14 million in tuition and fees. Um, so when an OPM enters that, uh, I don't have uh, big margins. Oh. So I can't share revenue as we did in the beginning. And actually our negotiations for the employer partnerships program, also we have no rev share in the state of Florida. There's just no margin. So I think if I were to give advice, go with that OPM, keep that contract short and make sure you have terms in there that really speak to what you're going to need to see uh, in order to continue the relationship. Let me follow up and just dig a little bit more. What would happen if the five million dollars a year from uh, the state went away? We wouldn't be able to do what we do. Okay. So I think every year I, I probably bring in um, 12 million in revenue and I, I spend 11. So I think uh, we the, price, the cost of online is significant. Um, now, I would say that I think the investment of UF Online has tremendous co-benefits for our residential program. Ask any instructional designer in the room, when you work with a faculty member to reinvent and transform a course into an online format, there are tremendous co-benefits for their residential course, their face-to-face -face course. Um, so the investment the state is making is also an investment that's paying off campus-wide. And I also don't run online in a mean way. <laughs> so if you're a faculty member and you work with us to develop a course online, you can take any part of that course and use it in your residential course. Um, we encourage faculty to do that. So there's investment that's, that's being made that can hopefully pay dividends for years to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Emmy. Sure. <clears throat> this whole issue of cost is uh, a complex one and uh, an ongoing one. And, and I think uh, David can probably provide us some additional insights. David, you're the Chief Academic Officer at Lumen Learning, and you have, I think, a unique perspective on some of the most challenging issues that higher ed conf is confronted with, one of, you know, of which, of course, is the issue of cost. According to Forbes magazine, student loan debt is now over $1.5 trillion, and it's still growing. 
how concerned should we be about that? <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about costs and how costs and affordability shape the future of online learning and higher education? Sure. So, really grateful for the invitation. Happy to be here. Thank you. Um, what's the big difference between the $1.5 trillion of student loan debt and all the other debt that students hold in their life? Can't, can't get out of it, right? Who said it? Um, it, it's a different kind of debt, and it's growing at an absolutely ridiculous um, rate. And that's partly because costs, costs are increasing, but the price of higher ed is increasing as well. And I guess it helps to split it up and think about it in terms of cost to deliver and the price the student has to pay. And even inside cost to deliver, you can break that up and look at it in a couple of different ways. Um, there's very, I think, reasonable research showing that the cost to provide teaching and teaching related services has been stable over the last 20 years after you adjust for inflation. Non-instructional costs are not stable. Um, you know, as we chase kind of college rankings, we spend a lot of money doing that with uh, whether it's the, the lazy river or the climbing wall or the luxury dorm or whatever the kind of favorite uh, kind of example that you like to poke at there is. Um, as we chase the best faculty, uh, faculty, and we'll talk about uh, the price of faculty more in a minute. Um, but sports programs, most sports programs lose money. Uh, there, there's all kinds of examples of non-instructional costs that are growing and growing, uh, even though instructional costs are staying the same. And then subsidies are decreasing at the same time that costs are increasing, which is kind of a terrible double whammy for students. Both the state funding is decreasing, and, and it's easy to say, well, why, why don't the states get serious about reinvesting in education? And if you look at where the increased tax revenue is going since everything happened with the economy, and you look at spending, uh, you know, mandatory spending programs like Medicaid or pensions and health benefits for retirees, those keep growing and growing and growing, and state budgets are a zero-sum game. And those are mandatory spending programs. So I think the, the likelihood that there's a huge rebound in education funding from the states is low. Um, and then the, the schools that are fortunate enough to have endowments, the kind of scholarships and tuition discounts that they're able to provide have been decreasing, not increasing. So costs are growing, supports are waning, um, and it looks like those two things will both continue to happen into the future. Mm -hmm. um, boy, if the only way to get an education is to go further and further and further into debt, then families have to keep doing that math on what's the value to me on the other side, what's the economic value to me <coughs> this degree on the other side of it, and how long does it take me to climb out from 20, 30, 50, $100,000 of student loan debt, and is it worth it or not? So. That's a very long way of answering your question. Should we be concerned about it? Yes, <laughs> we should be really concerned about it. Okay. I didn't even mention the cost of textbooks, which yeah. is what you all thought I was going to say. <laughs> I was, uh, why, don't you, why don't you mention the cost of textbooks <laughs> and how the Tell cost of more. The, the, the cost of instruction materials are? Yeah, I mean the cost of instruction materials is up a thousand percent since the 70s. It's growing in a way similar to very few other things. A lot of other stuff in the world gets less and less expensive as time goes on. It gets less expensive and it gets better. Look at the phone in your hand right now or the phone in your pocket right now. It gets less expensive and it does more and more and more. And there are some disciplines where we just don't seem to be able to pull that off and education is certainly one of them. Um, and in instructional materials in particular. And I think everybody understands but just to state the uh, state the obvious maybe one more time, there's a certain perversion in the textbook market in that it's not really a market, right? Because you have a faculty member who makes a decision about what a student is required to purchase. The way that a doctor prescribes a drug for you and your choice is either to purchase that drug or not purchase the drug, but you can't take your prescription down to the pharmacy and say, this one seems too expensive, I'd like to try something else please. Um, you know, you need the specific homework problems in the back of that book or you need the homework system attached to that platform. And the faculty member says, you will buy, then you buy. And when the person who's paying doesn't have a voice in the decision, there is no market pressure for prices to come down. 
And in the overwhelming majority of cases, faculty don't even know the price of the books that they're assigning. And so, you know, absent market forces that hold prices down, textbook prices have just become untethered from reality and kind of soared off in a, again, a crazy fashion. Can I just jump in and add, we've actually Please. seen that actually you don't buy. So even though they say you buy, you don't. So we have a lot of students that are just opting to not use the textbook. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is a significant problem. So there's been a lot of work around OERs, and to what extent is that the future of the breaking the sort of iron triangle that, that we talk about? Or what's the, what role will OER play, and how will it would be facilitated? So I, I, I think it's kind of easy to get, as educational technologists, let me make a general statement. Um, it's easy for educational technologists to get religion about a particular solution. Can we all agree that that's true? <laughs> whether it's online or whether it's OER or whether it's iPads or whether it's virtual reality or whatever it is, everybody seems to have their, uh, uh, we get solution focused and we get detached from the problem that we ought to actually care about. So you know, student learning is the problem we should care about. And it does seem like OER for the foreseeable future is going to be a really powerful lever to move that. Um, but I, I hesitate to talk about OER without first saying, let's not be zealous about specific solutions. Let's be thoughtful about problems and then understand why things might actually be solutions to problems. So for example, with the, with the cost of textbooks, you have this pathology in the non-market for textbooks. And what is it that makes those prices stay so high in addition to the funkiness of the market that's not really a market? Um, it's that even though these materials are all digital, and the nature of things that are digital is that I can just make 100 copies of them and share them with my friend and repost them on Facebook and make memes out of them and do whatever, textbook companies go out of their way to make sure that you can't do any of those things with their digital products. You can't copy them, you can't share them, you can't move them around in a digital, the way that we move everything around digitally. And so it's those restrictions that uh, in a world of abundance, the digital world is a world of an infinite number of copies of perfect fidelity. Um, in that world of abundance, we create artificial scarcity through the application of copyright law and digital rights management. So that's a problem. And that props up this kind of pricing. So if you understand OER to be educational resources whose copyright license is different, um, educational resources that are licensed in a way that let you copy them, that let you edit them, that let you share them, that let you move them around and do all the things that we normally do with other digital resources, then you can start to see how that attacks the very kind of enabling point that lets publishers prop up prices so high and pulls prices down. It also gives you all kinds of flexibility in terms of pedagogy. There's lots of other goodness associated with OER. But in terms of attacking the problem of textbook pricing, uh, we, talk, we talk kind of carelessly or talk loosely about OER being free. OER are free for you to copy, edit, and share. And as long as you can copy them and share them, there will be free copies of them floating around somewhere. That doesn't mean that there's not value for an institution or value for someone to add with wraparound services and things like that. Uh, but when you identify the problem as being copyright and the artificial scarcity created by copyright, then you solve that problem by taking away the artificial scarcity and making those resources abundant again. That's what OER does. Can you come in? Yeah, Tony. Uh, I, I want to go back to something that David said. He explained very, very well, and particularly for those of us in this audience who are in public higher education, uh, this, the last 15 years or so, there's been a lot of states that have really severely reduced their commitment to public higher education. And if we look at the country, about 65% of the students go to public colleges and universities. And when the states pull back, the colleges really just basically raise tuition. And I think that was a very, very important reason why the debt ballooned the way it was. 
the one thing that, if we're going to talk to the future, there's also something else interesting going on, and I think we'll hear a lot about it over the next couple of years, where some states, such as ours, is adopting a free tuition policy. And it's not free tuition for the lowest rungs in the socioeconomic ladder, but it will go up to, I think, if I got the number right, uh, households with incomes of up $125,000. $120, that's an, that's an interesting variable in all of this, whether it goes and picks up in a lot of other states, I don't know, but we have that policy now here in New York. It doesn't apply to things like uh, uh, residence halls and, and, and housing, but it does cover the bulk of all the tuition. So I think that's an interesting little development that we should keep our eye on. And here in New York, we're already taking steps in that direction. I know at, at City University, our applications are up around 30,000 students uh, last year as a result of that policy. I was just going to jump in that, so it's been our experience um, that our students are not price sensitive, which is fascinating considering our whole reason for being was to provide a more affordable option. So I, I take that one of two ways, okay, both ways, that basically, okay, so we're doing great. We're reaching a whole segment of the state in particular that really needed a more versatile, flexible option. Success, but the second part of that is we're not actually reaching the people that can benefit the most from the lower price. Um, and in part of that is because I think we've, we've reached and found a lot of folks around the state that just needed the option. But so I'll be fascinated to see how these different pricing models work because uh, our experiment was launched in 2013 under the heading that price was the difference. Um, but we've actually also seen a, about 30% of our fully online undergrads want to pay more. So we, uh, we had lower fees, including no fees to attend campus services, right? The rec center, the ride the buses, get student athletic tickets. And we had a lot of our online students complaining <laughs> that we were not treating them as students, that we were treating them as lesser than. So this is a fascinating case study in, in college pricing. So we had to launch something we call an optional fee package, um, which now brings in about 400K annually for the institution. These are students who want to have, the, especially their ID, be the same exact color as everyone else, even though they're fully online. They want to go to the rec center, they want to ride the buses, they want to go to the sport events, maybe not our basketball team, which kind of lost last night, but it may be, <laughs> this is awkward, so, but maybe our football team or baseball or soccer, or gymnastics or whatever. Uh, the point is that th there's a fascinating segmentation happening, I think, within our experience, and I'd like to spend more time over the next five years reaching those students who really need the lower price to, right, yeah. to enroll. I think there's some interesting intended and unintended consequences of these policies that are meant to increase access by lowering or reducing or eliminating tuition costs. So for example, I've talked to a, quite a few people in community colleges who are seeing the community college enrollment sort of gutted across New York State now. And the suspicion is that the Empire, uh, the, the Excelsior Scholarship Program has taken away a lever that community colleges had, which is we have lower costs. Mm. Now if all the costs are free, you see people's avoiding the community colleges and reducing enrollments there and we're losing support for the cultural centers in many areas that are not found anyplace else as students migrate towards other programs including their ability to migrate with online learning much more easily than they would have otherwise. So I think it's a complex uh, phenomenon that requires a lot of uh, thinking. There are more tensions than there are black and white easy solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I guess the question is, you know, what will happen in higher education? Will it become more affordable or less so? Um, there's a lot of people who think that online learning should make higher education less expensive. And MOOCs were going to make online education free for everybody all over the world at all times and in all places, or almost free, $49 or whatever it was going to cost. Should online education make higher education more affordable? And if not, why not? Shouldn't there be some redu reduction of costs? I think education should be lower cost and higher value. And I say that as a long time <coughs> public servant, that uh, w what's been happening, I think, is that we, especially the large public land grant research institutions, have been very proud of our $700 million in research. And oh yeah, you get an undergraduate education. Thanks for coming. Um, so I, I think that 
online education in particular is going to usher in a, a renewed focus on pedagogy at the undergraduate level with the resurgence and the rise of the instructional designer and the academic advisor. I think it will be a force for good um, uh, overall and I hope that that would increase the value of a, of a degree and our cost should also be going down as well. I think the other thing that I would just add that we've learned about um, you know, you see the, the UMass news, like you're saying, Missouri going to 25,000 by 2025. Um, there's a notion that the online student is far away, that they're sort of a commodity, and that they're not engaged. And we've seen a significant rise in cost of just serving online students who want to be physically in town, who want to have a very high touch experience, because surprise, they're students. So they're not necessarily this notion of a distance learner. So how do we, that's one of my thoughts for the, the future is, you know, how do we keep costs low while we absorb a lot of costs internally to manage these student services? And so how does that happen? Any manager would know, well, you've got to cut somewhere else. Uh, so we have to have this reckoning on our campuses of, so why do we have 8 million administrators and, and why do we have all of these different entities that do the same thing? So there can be a force for good in that as well, which is a lot of our business models as institutions hopefully maturing in order to keep costs low for the student, but shift and transform and have much more available, flexible campuses for the 24-hour online learner. I would just add that I, I think that um, Evie made a very important point. It seems to me that a lot of the colleges have been able to deliver online learning on the academic side, the instructional side, a lot less expensively than they were otherwise. Uh, that's good. Unfortunately, a lot of that has been on the backs of contingent faculty and adjunct faculty. I mean, since around 2011, 12, more courses are taught now in American higher education by contingent faculty than full-time faculty, uh, and I think that's an important issue. The other point that Evie made that is incredibly important, if you look at, and this is true across the board, if you look at the colleges that I think are successful with their online program, they've invested very wisely in student support services. The advisor, the counselor, the tutor, uh, they become very important for the students staying in, in the program. And I think that that is harder, that's more difficult to to, to scale without, without investment in it. Um, but that's a very important part of it. And I think a lot of colleges actually were, before online, they were doing a lot of, they were, they were realizing a lot of savings by cutting on those services, on the advisement, on the counseling, on the tutoring, if they even had tutoring. Uh, but on the, in the online environment, I think it almost becomes a requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm particularly yeah, I, for the fully online student. I, I have a hard time seeing how it's less expensive overall. Yeah. I used to have a faculty member, now I have a faculty member plus an instructional designer, plus an LMS administrator, and I pay a licensing fee for mm -hmm. my LMS, and, and, and. Uh -huh. And you talk about the reckoning that needs to happen. I, an institution that I worked at at some point in the past, which will remain nameless, I remember when we moved to online registration. So this is a long time ago. All the people that worked at the registration windows, when that was all fully automated and taken over by technology, did we let those people go? No. No, we found other things for them to do, mm -hmm. right? So now we're still paying the same amount for people and we've taken on the cost of the technology. And we seem to be, for better or worse, and we can argue about whether it's better or worse, we seem to be terrible at letting people go. There are no productivity gains due to technology in higher ed because you replace those people standing at the registration windows with tech, you find another job for them. You don't let them go. We move people around and we keep the same number of people and we stack technology costs on top of it and it doesn't make things less expensive. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, problem. I, I think that there are, have, there have been solutions that have been proposed and are actually being implemented. So for example, you've got uh, the Georgia e model where there's shared coursework at general education level across institutions. You've seen consolidation of colleges to share it to lower, to save funding. You see the development of low price degree programs, for example, Indiana University, University of California, San Diego, University of Texas, Austin, are all beginning complete online MOOC degree programs at lower costs. We, they follow suite of Georgia Tech. We kind of got the ball rolling with that with Coursera. You see the University of Illinois, the University of Michigan, Arizona State, also on the Coursera low cost 
MOOC platform degree option for credentialing. Are these the future of higher education, increasing the size of courses? Not, they're not going to be 160,000 students per class, but there, there has to be some, something's got to give in order to lower costs. And, and it seems to be the thing that's giving is the class size uh, restrictions. So, I mean, I'll share, in our experience, the students want um, the normal college experience, albeit in a more versatile and flexible format. They don't want to get the thousand person MOOC. They want to feel connected to the university community. They want to be a Gator. They want to feel like they're a full fledged student. Um, and they actually want psychology, biology, computer science. Um, now, we also know we're just one small player in, in the, uh, the national game. Um, but as I look out as, for the future and think about what am I going to be investing in, it's gonna, we're going to be investing in people. <laughs> so uh, I need amazing leaders to work with me to do this change. I was thinking of Eric's presentation and the management experience is key, but we're promoting from within. And I say that as a proud outsider. Um, you know, sometimes it helps to bring in some fresh perspective um, to look at these very challenging issues facing higher ed today. Um, to come in and kind of say, why do we do it that way? Um, and I think, again, in our experience, the students still want to have the small person class. Now, we do need to make that engaging, but one of my challenges is uh, working with our, our colleges and our faculty to really up our game in online. There's the 90s legacy of online being lecture capture. Um, and not being dynamic and interactive. And that's where we need to really uh, bring up the instructional designing cadre to really bring to our campus a lot of these really cool tools. And then the other thing I spend my time doing is connecting the innovators on campus, the faculty that have been doing this for a long time and have remarkable stories to tell other faculty. So we're in a, we're in a transformative time um, where we're trying to keep costs low for students you know, somehow stoke this energy of this rapid expansion, but we're going through remarkable uh, fights over the, across the dinner table within our system and within our campus about how are we gonna deliver these programs. So you have to be able to keep probably about eight different plates in the air um, while you're still ensuring that your students are getting the program that they're seeking. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, if you're talking about class size, it's not just an online issue, I mean, you look at your face-to-face -face classes, and I would bet mm -hmm. that the bulk of all your introductory courses are in large lecture sizes. It used to be a problem when they went up to 300. Now they're like 800, 900, and 1,200. And one good colleague of me, mine has, a, he has like 1,200 students in his class. So I think the idea of class size, um, it's, it's an issue both in face-to-face in -face as well as online. I think, I think it's all expanding, and a lot of it is to cut costs. I think it is to cut cost, but do you feel like there's a difference between being in a lecture center with 1,200 other people where there's a lot of face-to-face -face interaction even with your classmates and being in a 1,200 seat online course? Is that the future of online education to grow to three, four, or 500 seats online sections? And would that be a different experience, of, an equally satisfying experience to being in one of these large lecture halls? Well, I refute the notion that your large lecture halls have any face time. And I say that as a proud graduate of the University of Florida, where I think my whole first year was ginormous calculus, ginormous biology, ginormous econ. And I think my professor was down there at the front of the room with his transparencies. And I, I certainly didn't have face-to-face -face time with him, and there wasn't a lot of conversation going on. So thank God. I mean, so residentially, our, our, even our large lecture halls are getting more interactive and engaging. But for my kids, I have two boys, I wish for them an online interactive experience coupled with the ability to be a part of a community and to be a part of their local campus. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a tension between this desire for greater scale and our desire to maintain quality. What do folks think about where we're headed in this direction? It seems to be that the uh, the winners taking all are these mega universities that are sucking up all of these online enrollments and larger and larger online programs. And that's kind of why SUNY wants to go to a, a model with programs of 1,000 students, per, per, students per online program. What are the potential benefits? What are the potential downsides of programs of 1,000 or, or more than 1,000 students per program? 
you see any t tensions there between quality and scale? I mean, a thousand is actually kind of small when you look yeah. at Western governors at a hundred thousand. It's a hundred thousand not in a single program. We're talking about individual programs, say in a program in instructional design with a thousand students, a program in uh, cybersecurity with a thousand students offered by a single department in a single institution. I mean, we, uh, so we actually were contacted by the Chronicle for that mega university article and I think we were just basically like, we're not mega and we don't want to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. Uh, our, we have 58,000 students now, uh, about 10,000 of them are already fully online. Uh, we're not looking to grow, but rather shift in modality. Uh, we deny 60% of the applications at the UF online every semester. Uh, so we are always looking for the unicorn student who is academically amazing, but seeking a more versatile, flexible option. And how do you grow that uh, while maintaining quality is first and foremost on my mind every day. And it's faculty. So we have a five-year business plan out on the street now. In your spare time, one of the funnest things to do ever is to predict the next five years in a public document. I recommend it. So uh, our business plan is 2019 to 2024 where we had to kind of lay out uh, where we're going and uh, we talk about the fact that our next chapter is about investing in what we call the academic core. So faculty, advisors, and course production. Um, and that does mean we have to bring down marking. I just went through a restructuring, a reorganization. It is another miserable thing I would recommend. Uh, but so, you know, we can't continue to market in the way we did before. So that puts us at a great disadvantage to the mega universities. I was telling somebody, I don't think a day goes by, I don't hear an Arizona State ad in the state of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tell you how happy that makes me. But so um, that's where we have had to shift our investment to focus on value for our students. Uh, but we're going to lose out on students who have never heard of us and we're in the same state with them. Well, it's an interesting uh, tension. I think it's a, a dilemma. Yeah. You, you're, you give up on marketing. They continue to market to the tune of tens of millions of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Will you be able to maintain enrollments? And I think you had something to add, David. Yeah, can, can I tell a brief story? Absolutely, sure. Ba back, in the, you know, back in the late 90s when we were talking about, when we first started talking about moving courses online, we used to tell this story that we called the Polo Parable. Does anybody know the Polo Parable? The Polo Parable is a story about the athletic director that comes in to talk to the coach of his polo team. And they have one conference every year, and they're very successful, et cetera, et cetera. And the AD says, Coach, I've got a new challenge for you. I think you're going to be very excited about it. Uh, we're going to start a water polo team here on campus. And you're such an expert at coaching polo. We want you to coach. <laughs> water polo. The, I mean, it, it's water, but it's polo. I mean, it's right there in the name, water polo. <laughs> and we think that, uh, you know, we think that you've got a playbook that's proven to be very successful. You have these tried and true strategies. You've, one, you won conference every year for the last five years in a row, you're gonna do great, God bless you. <laughs> and this notion that we can take what we do in the classroom and just do it online, like it's, it's online class. It's right there in the name, it's a class. And there's this notion that the only responsible thing to do is to take all the tried and true methods that we know are time tested and, and work and do them again online. And it leads to this kind of lack of creativity where you don't step back and say, what are the unique affordances of this space that I'm in? What kind of different plays do I need to run? How is defense different now? How is offense different now than it was when I was on the back of a horse? Now I'm in a pool. <laughs> it has to change a little bit. And with this question of scale, I think the, the thing that we haven't broken through on yet is that there are pedagogical techniques that we could use in a small class, a group of 10 or 15 um, Socratic dialogue or whatever it might be that work really well at that size but totally collapse as you go to scale. You get to 100 students or 1,000 students. You can't use that method anymore. It must be true that there are pedagogical methods that work for 1,000 students that collapse and fail at 50 or at 15 or at 10. And because we normally teach 10 or 15 or 50, we've never seen them, we've never been able to find them. We can only find them by thinking differently about how to, you think a thousand people is, uh, is a, a detriment. Turn a thousand people, how, how can we turn them into 
a benefit to, to themselves and to each other. So the, this kind of determination that we have to take classroom models and replicate them online because they're tried and true keeps us from being able to find these pedagogies that work at scale but don't work in, in the smaller class size. So I wish we were doing more creative looking for those kind of teaching tasks. I don't, I don't have tremendous hope <laughs> well, for the pedagogy at scale. We have the best minds in the world from the elite Ivy League schools working to bring scale to online learning. And we have the highest attrition rates of any online model um, in the MOOC model. So I think there, I hope that there is something that works the way you're talking about it. Well, with, with, with all due respect to our colleagues at the top, top tier institutions in the world, I don't know that what their top tier at is pedigree. <laughs> Can I just make a comment? Um, okay, we'll let Tony go. Th this, morning, uh, this morning, Eric, Eric shared his, um, his research uh, uh, of surveying in, uh, online leaders. The number one issue was professional development, as I recall. I think if he had done that survey five years ago, professional development would have been the number one issue. 10 years ago, professional development would have been the number one issue. 20 years ago, professional development would have been the number one issue. And, and part of the, this question is the fact that many of our college faculty are never taught to teach. You know, the chemist, the philosopher, the historian, it is not likely that they took any type of course during their PhD work on how to teach. When you talk pedagogy to them, it is brand new. And I think that, I, I, one thing that I think on the plus side is that, as I gather, there's a lot of instructional designers in this room. And instructional designers, they're basically taught about pedagogical practice and, and philosophies and theories. And so the faculty have not. Yet they're the ones who are doing the teaching. And I'm not sure that's gonna change anytime soon, unless there's a lot of investment from people on the outside uh, who are gonna come in with the coursework and design the courses for the colleges and universities. And that will be an interesting tension, use that term earlier. That tension's already begun and it's gonna get more pronounced in the years to come. So did you just wanna jump in with something? I, saw, I thought I saw you go up. Uh, well, so one of the, the other fun parts about my job is that the model chosen at the University of Florida is that the same faculty that teach on campus also do the online teaching. Um, so I think, you know, back in 2014 when UF Online was launched, it was same faculty, same degree, so your transcript doesn't say UF Online, it says University of Florida. So this has been, um, I'm trying to remember which one of the speakers talked about it earlier, you know, and it might have been your provost, the fact that how are you going to all of a sudden teach all these people? Well, you need more faculty, you also need more faculty, uh, more instructional designers. Um, but we are finding that the online environment is thriving with adjuncts just as campus is because some of our best professors are adjunct professors and I say that as a proud spouse to a tenured biology professor who probably don't want him in the classroom. This is not on live stream, is it? <laughs> so I think, no, he's awesome, honey. Just kidding. So, but I think that the, uh, the faculty question is a huge one. Uh, we've also seen in some departments at the University of Florida a lot of reluctance to go online because of the notion that online is inherently impersonal, awful, taped, and not dynamic at all. So we also have to spend a lot of time and energy on campus just working with faculty, tenure tracked or not, to update them on the online learning of 2019 and how we, we are not the devil. When we show up, you know, people think we're out to remove the soul from their department. Um, and it's you no know, about how do we take what you're doing and help you make it better and help you put it online. So I think a lot of the, the faculty time and energy is something we underestimate as we go forward. Um, let me sw switch back for a second to, uh, to Tony. Tony, you're a lifetime board member of the Online Learning Consortium, uh, which aims to promote quality and scale. What is the role of these kinds of institutions and how do they shape a more promising future? Is it, is it through policy advocacy? Is it best practices of convening stakeholders? How, does, how do these organizations that are charged with quality help institutions like SUNY and others get to quality with, and scale? Well, when we started the Online Learning Consortium, it wasn't, it actually was the Sloan Consortium originally. 
And again, I mentioned someone earlier, Ralph Gomery, who he was the vice president for research for the entire IBM corporation. And uh, he was one of the major figures. And actually, when we first started the consortium around 1990, well, we didn't even call it a consortium then, we just had a community. Um, the first thing we decided to do was to develop a journal. And the purpose of that was to share research, share knowledge, because this was very new. Uh, and we established, actually it was the first free uh, re refereed online journal devoted entirely to online learning. And that was the first thing we did in 1996. There are a lot of journals now. Uh, and I think that was very important. And I think that still remains important in terms of what organizations like the Online Learning Consortium does. There are several others. I mean, there's, uh, there's UPSIA and what have you. And I, but I think quality was always at the forefront of what we were trying to do. We established this thing of five pillars that had to do with quality in terms of student access, student outcomes, faculty satisfaction, student, student satisfaction, scale. And uh, we've, we've, we've maintained our commitment to that. I think the other important thing are, are events like this in terms of getting people together to share knowledge, whether it's research or whether it's best practices, what we're doing in our institutions. And I would guess that was probably our second uh, emphasis in terms of the consortium. When we started to go, we started, a, well, we started meetings in the 90s, but we had our first, I would say, international conference in 2001. And that continues to be very successful. Uh, the last item, I think that is the area that I have a lot of problem with, and that is with policy. Uh, if we're talking, well, education policy, you have the federal government and then you have 50 states that, that control uh, education policy. Uh, the states can operate independently on a lot of issues, um, and how they do it changes from state to state. At the federal government, I think we can look at some positive things. I remember around 2010 or 11, the Education Trust, if some of you remember their study in terms of looking at colleges, uh, in terms of the amount of financial aid that they were distributing and the success rate of their students. And they basically ended up exposing a lot of the issues with less than scrupulous colleges that were completely being funded by financial aid and yet their students were not graduating. Some with abysmal graduation rates of like 5%. I won't mention who, but okay. as a result of that, there was a lot of federal policy that evolved in terms of, of uh, looking at who receives financial aid and time to completion of degree. And that is still with us. That may disappear soon, but it, it, was, it, but it took about five or six years during the uh, President Obama, Arne Duncan uh, Department of Education to address that. But there are a number of important policies that evolved out of that. Uh, that's on the positive side, I think. On the negative side, I mean, um, and I'll, I'll stay with the Obama administration, with, uh, with the Arne Duncan White House, if you looked at some of the people who were in key positions, uh, one article in the New York Times basically said that this is the, this is the Bill Gates uh, White House, uh, Department of Education based upon the number of people who had Gates Foundation and Gates Corporation associations with uh, who are now in key positions in, in the Department of Education. And the Gates Foundation is not a philanthropy of the old time where a lot of money was given out. It's a philanthropy where uh, it is looking to influence policy. In some ways, they, they spend upwards of six, seven hundred million dollars a year just strictly on policy uh, influencing. So that to me is on the downside. Uh, so. And when you get that kind of money, we can do something in our, in our consortiums, in our organizations. But I don't think we've got the, the big stick in this, in, this, in this place. And I don't want to go into the current White House and the current Department of Education because we'll be here until Monday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any comments on, on that? I'll just share that, um, again, relative newcomer to higher ed, like it's expensive to join all these groups. Um, so as you, as you look at your budget, um, I think these forums are awesome, this exact forum. And actually, I've tried to start picking up the phone. It's a little old school, uh, but calling other me's. So I want your list, Eric. 
so we can start a phone tree. But basically, you know, just commiseration, information sharing, and not necessarily like, hey, what's the latest, what's the latest pedagogical approach to STEM, but like, so what's your marketing budget? So how are you reaching students out of state? You know, these sorts of things. So I enjoy going to the meetings. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's, there's something to be said for just picking up the phone. Mm -hmm. David, anything? No? Let me get back to you, I mean, just real quickly. On the issue of technology in the near term, what do you see as enabling technologies that are in current use at UF and what's on the horizon? Um, so our faculty would answer this better. So I'll, I'll speak to the program level. So I'm very much focused on fostering a greater sense of community across our online student body. So we have over 3,000 fully online undergrads, and I want to find a way to connect them more. So um, uh, one day I love Salesforce. The next day I'm like, oh, they're the next Google. They're taking over. So I think uh, one of my big focus areas is on community-based uh, collaboration, on, on the use of Salesforce to connect a lot of our business services. It's, it's spreading like a virus across so many of our business lines, but bringing amazing things with it. Um, but I'll go back. I'm, uh, I think, again, I think the future is human. Um, so I actually think that the most critical issues we have in the future of UF Online are going to be uh, retaining, recruiting, and hiring um, amazing people to leverage the many different technologies, because there's so many. And, and I do think we've become a little obsessed. Um, and I also you know, really defer to faculty by field, by department, on what technology they need. So my job is to really make sure that we lower the hurdles for them to use whatever's the latest cool thing. Um, and at the same time, we build institutional knowledge. We have a center for online innovation and production at the University of Florida. We invest about a million bucks a year in fortifying that center to be the place that knows about the latest tool that can then absorb a really good best practice from one faculty member and make sure it's reproducible uh, for another. But I think when we, we think about the future of higher ed, we think about some magical company that's going to come in and solve everything or some magical benefactor that's going to come in and, and, and then like balloons are going to fall from the ceiling and it's going to be the future. It's going to be great, right? Um, when really I look across our campus, we have 5,000 faculty, about 13,000 staff, and we're going to have to invest in these conversations about students, who they are. Um, I saw, I think it was the, the UMass Online announcement was a focus on the working learner. I'm like, well, most of our students are working learners. Like most students today have a job. So I think we're, we need to update our conversation. I'd rather spend time on, on those sorts of human-based activities than necessarily recommend a technology. Okay. David, let me move over to you. I think higher education faces some other challenges, including increasing competition from alternative credentialing providers, the traditional higher education does. Competency-based education is one. Lower cost micro-credentials and badges potentially represent another from other kinds of organizations. How can higher education remain relevant in, the, in this environment? And does online learning assist with increased competition from new forms of credentialing? Yes. <laughs> OK, good. I'm glad I got that one <laughs> out of the way. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the same way that faculty require students to purchase textbooks and that disconnect lets textbook prices kind of float around. Um, if you think about why the majority of students are willing to spend 20, 30, 50, however many thousands of dollars to come and get a degree, it's because employers require students to buy a degree. The same way that faculty require students to buy textbooks. Now, not all of them do, of course. But, you know, there's an interesting move in the last two or three years, and it's across many sectors of employers who are starting to say, you don't, you don't actually need a college degree to be eligible to work here anymore. So whether that's technology companies like Google, Apple, IBM, who've all made that move, or Lowe's and Home Depot, who've made that move, or Costco and Publix and Whole Foods, who've made that move, Increasingly, employers are saying a college degree is not the one and only gate into employment. And as soon as that becomes widespread, as soon as the majority of employers say, well, the college degree would be preferred, but we'll also accept these other things, um, 
if there were a cheaper pathway for your son or daughter to be eligible for a job, would you put up 50 grand for them to go get the more expensive way of being eligible for that job? And I know that higher ed's not only about preparing people for employment, but it is true that if you're sitting in this room, you're a person who is definitely in the minority. You were good at school, you liked school enough, you thought, you know what, I'd like to keep doing this for a career. I want to stick around at school. And most people don't think that way, right? For most people, school is a medicine that is very expensive, and I'll take it for as long as I have to take it to get the result I want, and then I'm done, right? So the degree to which employment becomes detached from degrees has a lot to do with the value of our degrees. And I don't know that they're, you know, the only thing that we can do relative to micro-credentials or badges or whatever is continue trying to make the case that no, there's more value in our degree than there is in that other credential. But at the end of the day, that's the employer's it's largely an employer decision. And so it's not just a case that we have to make. You know, today we make a case to students. Um, we're not far away from having to make that case to local employer who employs two-thirds of the people in our town. We really need you to require a degree. Because if you stop requiring a degree, we don't know what happens to our enrollment. Um, I, I don't think we appreciate, you know, we've been talking about how these systems are all complex and have different parts that influence and affect each other and there are unintended consequences all over the place. Um, I don't think we appreciate the value to which employers requiring a degree props up the value of the degree, makes students willing to go into debt to, to hand out huge sums of money. So when you ask how do we compete with micro-credentials and badges, I think it becomes a question of, at some point we have to not only talk to students, we have to turn and talk to employers as well and say, there's real value in you continuing to require a degree. Mm -hmm. And if we can't make that case and that comes apart, it's going to get real. <laughs> I think it's real right now. <laughs> Just look at the Trump administration. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, I don't think employers are going to listen to us, A. <laughs> uh, but I also, so two things. One is we're all employers in the room. So the other really interesting thing to think about is if a resume came across your desk today, and it had a certificate from company X or university, like what would you think? So you're totally right that the perception of employers matters, but I think there's a tremendous lag. Now that also varies completely by discipline. So IT obviously is no longer, was it ever, requiring a bachelor's degree. Um, but I'll, So we're working with Disney, Walmart, and Discover Financial Services uh, and what's fascinating, and I got to give a shout out to Disney, they are working with their frontline hourly workers and offering them full pay degrees, and not just to UF Online, but to other institutions. And they develop these handouts where they describe for their workers, here's your current job, here are the career pathways at the company, and then here are the degrees you should get. So as a, as a public university offering bachelor's degrees, this was awesome. Gold. Yeah. Right, and it also, it, it gives us an insight into how we need to do better at talking about the relevancy of our programs, include, I'm a proud proponent of liberal arts bachelor's degrees as a beacon of light on a resume of someone who can communicate and synthesize and, and collaborate. So I think that, you know, there are these really interesting um, ventures out there, not just to get enrollment by working with employers, but to learn from employers mm -hmm. and what they're interested in. Yeah. And then I also think we obsess a little bit about the fear of the certificate or the badges, um, but I would like to do some of them ourselves, some stackable credentials at the undergraduate level. Uh, but the reality is a lot of employers right now, I don't think they know what to do with them. And that varies. Um, so I think we have time uh, to work this out of it. I think there's also an important cultural issue here. I mean, in terms of what the value of a higher education is, or any education, um, I, I, I would say that uh, if we want to, if we're hoping or waiting to see that there's a wide acceptance of something less than a baccalaureate degree, and we're seeing a little bit of it now, mm -hmm. but whether we're going to see it in some mass way, I think that if we look at the children of the, of the people in the higher income brackets, if they start doing it, then people in the lower income brackets might be doing it. I'm a little afraid that we're, we're, we're proposing that you don't need a degree for people who are in the lower income brackets. 
And when I see people, the children of people from Harvard or Yale say, you don't have to go to college, just, just apply for this job, then I think people in the lower income brackets might do the same thing. So I think there's a cultural issue there that we have to be careful about. That was one of the, the tragic things about, so I was just in California interacting with thousands of hourly workers and um, they had been, I, I would say, unabashedly lured by for-profit online entities to spend thousands of dollars. dollars they didn't have to earn credentials that will never transfer to an accredited institution. And it breaks your heart. I mean, there, there are people who are like, hey, I have this associates from ITT Tech, and so can I get my computer science degree? Um, so the notion, of, I think you're totally spot on. There are a lot of folks who are perhaps first gen that are navigating the environment, and they might think, okay, I'll go to this institution. Oh, it's start any time. I just pay like this. Oh, I get federal aid. They run out of federal aid, um, and they're left with a credential that might not get them where they need to go. Now, there are exceptions to this always. Um, and I think actually a lot of the for-profit sector causes the public universities to actually sit up and take notice and that we should be more innovative like them. But I worry about the students who were frankly preyed upon by some of the lesser actors that are now left in debt and without a lot of options. And just to tie it off, the other way to combat competition from competency-based programs or micro-credentials or whatever it might be is to do them better than anyone else does them. Mm -hmm. Be the provider. Yep. Yeah. If you do them better than anyone, then they're not a they're not a threat to you. Yep. Okay. I in this discussion of employers being the sort of definers of what higher education is, I think about the movie Idiocracy, and I have some fears <laughs> that if all we do is train people for an increasingly <coughs> automated workforce, uh, it could be dangerous. They say. Uh, the factory of the future will have two humans and two living beings in it. One will be a dog, one will be a human. The human's job will be to feed the dog, and the dog's job will keep the human away from the machines. So <laughs> I think <laughs> it's worrisome. <laughs> Which brings us to this final sort of topic of advances in technology, uh, and very advanced technologies, brain machine interfaces, artificial intelligence as a force that will transition within a higher education to sort of a, a new, potentially a new model. Mm -hmm. And what education might look like in five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years out with advances in artificial intelligence and the automation of basically sort of many, many things. Um, given efforts to reduce costs and price and potential instructional technologies advances in the next 20 years, will the campus experience become a luxury for affluent students and those with less means will utilize technology to gain an education? Will the campus become virtual? Will automation take over instructional roles? What role will faculty play in the future of higher education? And what can we do to pre what we pre preserve what we value most? Tony, you want to take a step? Uh, I think that, uh, that's, that is an important question. When we talk about the future, there isn't one future. There's going to be multiple futures. And what happens over the next five years may not happen in the next 10 years, may not happen in the next 15 or 20 years. I think there are different futures. I think over the next decade or so, we will see evolution of what, of what started now, uh, and they will just continue, things will continue to improve. I think we've heard various things today that there are certain technologies uh, that will improve. Adaptive learning is one. I think learning analytics will be, will be used more widespread. None of those make extensive use of things like artificial intelligence yet. Uh, they are there and they will continue to improve. There's a lot of money that's being invested in it that will make them improve. But in another maybe 10 or 15 years, I think artificial intelligence will start kicking into how we teach and what we teach. And it will affect not just our, our, our institutions, but in fact, lots of aspects of, of employment. And, um, and I, I think we're gonna be start, the academy is gonna start thinking about what its purpose is uh, when large-scale artificial intelligence kicks in in another 10, 12, 15 years. And I, I, I'll just share a story with you. Uh, there's a competition that goes on every two years, and it's called the, uh, the uh, let me just get this, it's a mouthful, the Critical Assessment of Structure Prediction. And it looks at, uh, some people consider it like the World Cup of Biochemical Research, but it looks at 
a problem called the protein folding problem. And it attempts to look at what will this look, what will, what will this protein folding look like? It has never been solved. And every two years, some of the most important research groups around the country and beyond come together and add to what, what they found out about this issue. The last one, which was in December of 2018, uh, the winner was a group of individuals from DeepMind who developed the algorithm to solve the problem, not to solve the problem, but to come closest to solving the problem. And one of the, uh, one of the biologists from Harvard who actually headed up the Harvard B, uh, research group, his name was Mohammed al Karashi, said, I was surprised and deflated. They were way out in front of everyone else. He criticized various groups, pharmaceutical companies, including his own university, that they were not kept keeping up with this technology. And so he said he felt this melancholy and alluded to what was his purpose? What was he going to be doing? And he said, in the future, I'm not going to be looking at this problem. I'm going to be working with the machine that's going to be solving this problem. And I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow, but I do, I do think that's in the future for higher education. And I think the academy, both on the research end, if one of our major purposes is to share knowledge and to develop knowledge. I think that is at the mission of many of our institutions. If we're going to develop knowledge, I think a lot of the research in the years to come is going to be done through algorithms more so than by individuals in the, or individuals working with algorithms. And the algorithms may be the lead researchers. In terms of teaching, uh, which is to share our knowledge, uh, I think with adaptive learning, with pressures in terms of costs and financing in the years to come, and not in the 20s, but probably beyond. Uh, and the fact that if we look at some of the models that we even espoused a little bit today, we talked about Western Governors University. Uh, their model is essentially a tutoring model. It is not a teaching model. There's a script that's followed, essentially. And that's true at a number of these institutions that have large scale enrollments. The faculty's role is reduced to being a tutor. And I think that's an issue also that we will be facing in the little bit more distant future. So I do think that there is this whole question of, a, of what our purpose is going to be and how it's going to be changed. And you used several times the term tension. I think the tension that we, you feel now is nothing like we're going to feel in another 10, 12, 15 years. And we may not be the only industry facing that, by the way. So I'm actually giddy about the future, and I think that AI and VR have an awesome role to play. So, and I and I say that as someone who's inherently lazy, lazy. <laughs> that's what I said. So, um, pick academic advising. I think very soon we should have a greater use of AI and academic advising, not to get rid of the humans, but to enable our humans to do higher value personal activities with our students and engaging them. Um, I think it was in 1990. Whew. Well, maybe 2000 in the federal government where we figured out how to do smart, frequently asked questions. Why is higher ed still figuring this out? So, um, you know, we should be deploying AI to provide better services to our students. Now, I'm a big fan of the fact that um, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of the campus experience. So I think it's going to be a matter of, um, I have a vision for a large public land grant as the hub of learning whose students are mobile there at any distance and at any given time they can decide if they're local, if they're far away, they have the ability to interface with AI services, they have ability to interface in VR. How cool would it be to have my kids having an actual conversation with Einstein about his theory? Um, so there's an amazing opportunity I think for learning, an amazing opportunity for our faculty to engage these technologies in new ways to work with our students. Uh, we just have to bring the hurdles down for our faculty to actually have some time for creativity which goes back to our fundamental human challenges that we expect our faculty, at least at UF we do, to be tremendous researchers, tremendous teachers. They also got to keep the time. And so how do we usher in a better model of teaching teams and that sort of a thing? But I think the academy is going to be a thriving place going forward as long as we don't um, see a lot of these forces as forces that are, are going to be um, bad and not could actually be things that we kind of harness. 
Um, I also think there's an imperative because retail, retail companies and others are going to automate all of their stuff over the next 10 years. There's going to be millions of Americans out of work. So the issue, I think, is the imperative is like, okay, so how are we helping those uh, students upskill, career shift, um, and how are we becoming less uncomfortable with being relevant? So higher ed, um, almost uh, in some corners, if it's relevant, then it's probably not sophisticated or elite. Um, I'll tell you the one thing that makes me popular on campus is that I have a denial rate of 60%. The fact that UF Online denies 60% of our applications is academic gold, okay? So, but that is so sad, right? So the fact that we let few people in makes us really academic. Um, and that is so backwards. <laughs> so the issue I think is gonna be how, or, I mean we have some, uh, in my spare time I head up a statewide task force looking at STEM labs for online students. Um, labs in the online space and the hybrid space, this is an exciting future. Um, and I think that what we'll do is our physical campus will remain a hub of activity and a gathering point, and we'll have great homecoming tailgates, but we'll have the ability to really uh, wrap the entire globe in our campus, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of it. Okay, David? Yeah. Um, maybe just two thoughts to add to what's already been said. The first is that this idea of kind of intelligent machines automating away part of the faculty role already here, has been here for a long time, and faculty are thrilled about it. So for example, if you were to propose to a math faculty that they should go back to grading all of the math practice done by all of the students in their course by hand, they would kill you, <laughs> right? Automated systems generate math problems, grade math problems, give feedback on math problems, and if you don't get it right, I'll generate another one for you and grade it. Still didn't get it? I'll generate 15 more for you and you know, knock yourself out, right? And that is absolutely intelligent automation that has taken something off a faculty member's desk. It's already here. There's more of it coming and it might be different as it, it will be different as it continues to come. But this is not some kind of crazy Star Trek future scenario. We're, we're living in the middle of it right now. It's just, once you get familiar with it, it can kind of become hard to see, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the other thing to say here about the role of kind of advancing technology is that regardless of where you come down on the are we preparing students for employment or not debate, I do think we all agree that we're trying to prepare students to go out and be successful people in the world. And the world is being changed a lot by these technologies as well. You know, I think many of us can remember a time in school when we raised our hand, not to pick on math, but we raised our hand and said, why can't I use the calculator on this math problem? And the teacher said, well, what are you gonna do when there's not a calculator there? <laughs> well, when's the last time you weren't in a room with 300 other calculators, <laughs> right? I mean, there, Every, in fact, just yesterday, Windows open sourced their calculator software for the, the comes on the uh, on Windows when you buy a computer. But have we kept up with that reality of the world in the way that we do instruction? And as the world continues to change, do the things that we teach change so that people are prepared to go out and live in that world as opposed to live in the world that we grew up in? Because it was good enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> We also have some time for questions from the audience, I think. Go ahead. I have Don't turn on questions. Questions. I'll hear first on Michael. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you have uh, delved into some good discussion on this. My name is Arvind Didi, and I am from SUNY Oswego. Uh, so if I have to take two things away from this, uh, you know, the day-long activity, the first one is social presence. And the one that you said, what is the next best thing in technology? And you said humanity, yeah. you know, being human. So this also reminds me of the, the movie about 14 years ago, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Uh -huh. you know? So what is technology doing to us? And also now I'm in higher education and I've been teaching, but how decisions are made? What do the administrators look for? And ultimately, as I'm seeing, and you have pointed out, the one thing that I hear in academia are two things, academic freedom and academic uh, flexibility, right? Yeah. But then my thing is great 
uh, freedom comes with greater responsibility, great flexibility comes with greater accountability. And those things, I think, are not being talked as much as we should. And what's happening at the grassroots level is something that we are not focusing. We get data, but where is it coming from? What are we looking at? So these things, I mean, this is more than a, I mean, I'm just commenting on this, but we need more dialogue and more, what is technology doing to us? Are we like the wildebeest migration that happens? Mm -hmm. Everyone is running. Why? Because everyone else is running. Mm -hmm. But for what? I don't know. <laughs> and are we creating like Rambo of the first blood? We are training them to kill, you know? Kind of, I mean, they're graduating with debt, and it is increasing. 1.3 million, a trillion, and now it's going to be 1.5 trillion. So what are we doing? Mm. We are doing same things and expecting different results. And what is that called? Mm. But when it happens, what it is called? Miracle. So we are hoping for that, I guess. I will point out that the wildes wildebeest are moving for water. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a legit reason why they all kind of head different directions. But I think you're, I mean, I think uh, not only what are we doing, but I actually, um, I actually worry about the social connectivity of our students uh, and their ability to interface and talk face to face. And I say that as someone who isn't that old yet. Um, but I walk across our campus and I can get maybe three students to look me in the eye. Um, and that's all of our residential students as well. So how are we really, you know, en encouraging and promoting social presence within these technologies, I think is very important. Particularly as young people coming up and the people who are going to be coming into college, their experience with social media is increasingly really toxic. With people teaching them how to commit suicide when they're 14 years old and mm -hmm. telling them they're worthless and the, the kind of self-doubt and issues that are caused when you see all the perfect Instagram lives of all of your friends and then you think about the kind of horrible, dull, whatever reality of your own life. There's, we've got to connect them socially. We, the internet's the greatest communications medium ever created. Right? If we turn it into a tool for just downloading things, that's utterly ridiculous. We have to be connecting people to each other, but we have to support them mm -hmm. in ways that those relationships that they build, the things they say, the things they do together are positive and uplifting and supporting learning and not dragging people down in some, at least in Utah now, um, suicide rates related to social media use among teens are, it is an issue that's really growing rapidly. And so there's a question of how do we get ahead of that? And those are the people that are coming to our campuses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think David raises a very important point, and it's not just, I mean, it's an education issue, but it's really a societal issue in terms of social presence. We, we've really replaced, you know, the kids playing in the playground and, 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 and doing all these things with each other, roughhousing or whatever, with a lot of social media. I mean, the, the kids are attached to their, to their phones, as well a lot of adults. I mean, several times I looked around this table and although there was very interesting things being said, everyone's like this and, 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 and can't get away from their phones. And I'll tell you an interesting story. There was a couple of comments here about their own personal experiences. I have four grandchildren. Uh, the oldest is 14 years old. And uh, my daughter, who lives in Seattle, she sends them to us. I live in New York for two or three weeks every summer. And uh, I remember I would love to, when they, when the, they would come, I would get books for them to read at night and whatever and read them to bed. It was a wonderful experience. I loved doing it. Uh, it really made me bond with these, with these little guys. And uh, last year, my grandson said to me, Grandpa, I want to teach you Fortnite. It's kind of an awesome And he game. proceeded to teach me Fortnite. Any of you know the game? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. He says, Grandpa, all you do is you stay behind the bush <laughs> and don't shoot your gun, That's he says, insane. and you'll come out in the top five. <laughs> and he was 100%. So I had to just hide throughout the whole experience. Uh, but that's what we're, I mean, that's what we're up against. And it's not just educators, it's, it's the entire society is up against this. Okay. I mean, that's a good management strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I think you're going to have the last question, the last word, before you start the presentation. Yeah. Oh, good. All right, go ahead. Not a question, but a provocation because you asked me to. Uh, oh, Jesus. So, come on. You know, you, know, you invite the guy to the party, what do you expect? Um, 
So, Peter, you said that you did subscribe uh, OPMs as investors. I think you're exactly right. Um, I won't make the case that they are, that that's a good thing in and of itself, but I, I will make the case that that is a positive indicator. Um, they are, you know, I'm, we're talking about uh, the classic OPM model where the uh, company pays the upfront costs and in return gets an ongoing share of revenue from, tui from in tuition, right? Um, they, they are indeed investing long-term in the university. And it's, in fact, a high-risk investment because they're dependent on uh, university partners who aren't known for their stellar execution. Pearson took a bath on their deal with uh, Cal State, for example. Um, and they're investing because they think that universities are a good long-term bet. Um, and they're not the only ones. I mean, Guild Education is, you know, a good example of a company that is uh, showing how companies uh, th think that they, you know, investing in their employees' college education is a good bet. The, the tuition uh, uh, subsidies or, or complete subsidies that New York and other states are talking about or doing are showing, uh, you know, that states are starting to see college education as a good uh, bet. So, um, you know, there's a, let's try to turn some of those frowns upside down. Yeah. We, I, I, we live in a, we live in a world where for the first time in human history, it is at least conceivable that we can provide every human on the planet with an educational opportunity equal to their p potential and where uh, lifelong learning is no longer a platitude but an economic reality. So the, the economic potential, now you have to, to weigh that against the medium term uh, uh, demographic factors which are not good for the Northeast. So it's, it, in part, it's a question of math, and in part, it's a question of rate, speed of the ability of the universities to be nimble and change. Yeah, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't use the word investor in a pejorative sense exclusively, or, or, <laughs> even, or even primarily. Um, I think that currently, higher education, many institutions uh, in many states throughout the United States are confronted with a sole source of investment for online education. And that is problematic, I think. I think when you have a, a monopoly, it's not a real <coughs> monopoly, but a limited number of investors who can charge 50% of the tuition revenue as their fee for five, seven, 10, 12 years, you may not be getting the best investment uh, advice or rate of, that you could possibly get if there were more investors in that marketplace. So I w frequently think, I wish there was a bank of SUNY that we could go to instead of necessarily a, a limited pool of OPM investors and w that offered a, a potentially a better deal. But I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that investment's a bad thing or that OPMs are a bad thing. We, as a university, are currently in, in the midst of developing OPM contract, which mm -hmm. I'm overseeing. So I, I think it's a, it's a good source of funding to grow things. So can I see your provocation and provoke you? <laughs> okay. So, oh, excellent. <laughs> this is gonna go great. So I think um, one thing I would ask people to ponder is what is the inherent difference between the public sector and the private? So I think we had a great synergy with an OPM, but let's not act like they're just in it to help students. So there is clearly a profit motive that comes with any private institution, any private company, right? So um, I don't know, have you worked with an OPM before to implement an on -scale, a large on -uh scale online program? No. Okay, so then I think what I would add is that actually what happens when a public institution interfaces with an OPM uh, because of the investment, the public institution tends to then take on the private incentive, the private behavior. So for example, we had tensions with our OPM over prerequisites, over admission standards. To what extent was the university too uh, strict? To what extent were we requiring prerequisites as an inhibitor to access? Um, no, this was an inhibitor to profit. 
So what happened was the institution said, actually, no, they need to come in with statistics if they're going to prevail. They need to take Calc 1, 2, and 3 if they're going to get a computer science degree. That's one example. Another example we had was um, how we coach students, how we advise students. Uh, the profit motive drives coaches from an OPM to encourage that student to continue to enroll. Why? Because they get a rev share of the tuition. Whereas the institution might encourage you to take a semester off. Or we might encourage you to seek out a different degree at a different institution. So I think to what extent do public institutions retain their autonomy and their leadership role in those agreements? And I would like to see more public institutions leveraging the investment from the OPM but still remain in the driver's seat. Uh, because I think uh, another, I've heard other examples across the country because colleges talk and, you know, well, the OPM wants to work with us, but they only want to bring our business program online. The OPM doesn't see any value in bringing our liberal arts degrees online. So play this out 10 years from now, 20 years from now, uh, to what extent will our public institutions become solely profit motive based? And therefore, our workforce and our knowledge across our society be very localized in certain areas. So I think that we're learning a lot based on these relationships with OPMs. But I think it's, it's important for public institutions to rise up and say, OK, what's our responsibility to learners that need a more flexible, versatile option? And where can we go it alone? Or where can we learn from the OPM, but not assume that we can only do it with an OPM? Can I make a comment? Uh I think Evie uh, introduced something very important there. Um, I think we only mentioned it briefly, but our colleges and our universities, uh, they're not just one entity. We have these different areas. We have the liberal arts and sciences, which a lot of people espouse to. I'm one of them. Uh, and we have the STEM areas and we have the professional areas. These are all very different areas that we have to decide what we want to do with them. I mean, do we want to do what Wisconsin is and eliminate you know, 13 liberal arts majors as they did about a year ago? Or do we want to keep them? We think there's some value there. But they don't necessarily, the philosopher doesn't necessarily lead to a job. So do we just do business and education and nursing? I would think that's a mistake. Um, our job is not just to provide the workforce. It's an important part of what we do, but it's not just the only thing we do. And the other part of this, which is a little bit of a reach, but I get concerned because I think some of our states, and we mentioned the Northeast, but it's not just the Northeast, uh, the finances uh, situation of some of these states may push colleges or university systems to do things. Uh, if we look at what went on in Wisconsin, where 12 community colleges basically were eliminated in nine months and became extension centers of senior colleges, I think that's a concern. And it isn't just because there was a, a governor who was, uh, who was uh, let's say, politically uh, not really supportive of public higher education. The same thing is going on in Connecticut, where we have Democratic governors and 13 community colleges will be centralized under one administration within the next two years. And I think those are issues that we have to face as a university, as an academy. And it isn't just the technology. I think a lot of has to do with the culture and the financial situation that we find ourselves in as to what's going to happen. OK, I think uh, we're up 4.07. We're only, only going to go to 4 o'clock. So we have one more question. So that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so. so so technology has kind of like always, we've always seen this elimination of, of jobs with technology, with automation. I mean, like human history is kind of, but every time that happens, there's also the evolution of current jobs or the expansion of roles, often usually with a higher skill set. So for those of us who are at institutions who are also preparing the future faculty, what, what do we need to be thinking about uh, in our preparation of faculty, uh, you know, our, our next generation of PhDs who maybe are going to be entering into the workforce in 2030? Good question. Well, um, up until last year, I was, I was the executive officer of a PhD program in, in, in education, urban education. Uh, but I was in a center at CUNY where we had 32 PhD programs. Uh, in the professional areas, 
at least in education for now, and in, I would say the health sciences, there are jobs. But if we graduate someone with a PhD in history, uh, there may be something like 900 applications for that job. And what's that person going to do? I'm not sure. And the true, and we can go through the 32 uh, majors and, and see where they fall. And I attended many meetings where my colleagues in the liberal arts were really concerned. Again, the historians, the philosophers, the language, the art historians, the English literature people. We have to, we have to I think, be honest as to what is the future for those PhDs. Now, a lot of schools are trying to integrate something that is a little more practical. We have the digital humanities. I don't know if that's going to work. I, I don't know. I'm not saying it won't work or it will work, but I don't know if it's going to work. And I think we have to be honest with our students who we're admitting into our doctoral programs. Um, I mean, I think we need to reduce the number of students we're producing with PhDs or be very honest with them as to what their job outlook is. And we know that we have lots, and unless they want to have a life of you know, contingent faculty where they're going to be adjuncting, uh, my sense is that the number of full-time faculty as a percentage, if not in real numbers, of the faculty who are teaching courses in our colleges and universities in 2030 is going to be much smaller. And I think they're going to be teaching in a very different way. Uh, I hope it's for the better. I'm not sure that's the case. And I think it depends upon whether administrations and education policy may make us at the mega level will continue to invest significantly in higher education. And I don't think it's just a regional issue, although places in the Northeast are experiencing that already, I think, to some degree. I would actually say I think the need for um, faculty will rise. Um, and I think the, I mean, we're kind of in a, a crisis now as a society on kind of what is fact, right? And what is knowledge and what is expertise. So I think the, the role of experts will continue. I think though, so I, when I think about a PhD, it's someone who's reached, reached that terminal degree in a field and that brings with them, so this is my assumption, a great expertise in a given field. So I think the issue, of course, will be in a large campus, most certainly there's going to need to be a greater familiarity with technology, uh, an updated notion of pedagogy. Uh, and also I, I would recommend also some further tutelage in how to train students. I mean, faculty that are doing research, they also have these remarkable research teams. And um, so it's not just a pedagogical notion of the classroom, but it's also how you mentor, how you promote, and how you work with um, your own graduate students, and how you work as a team, these sorts of things. Uh, but then you're, you're spot on, of course, that there's not necessarily going to be the tenure track position. But there actually is a great higher calling in teaching. And that conveying your knowledge of your field is, is a very powerful calling, but certainly there needs to be more discussion about what career options are possible. I'm also now a student in a PhD program because I just like to punish myself. So I work full time, I'm also in class, and so, and there's a lot of people that are there for, if you study human capital theory, they're there for signaling, right? So you're there to get the thing as a signal to others about what you can do, not necessarily to actually take that knowledge and publish, right? So that's another kind of deliberate track that I think we need to embrace for a lot of folks. And I'd say if you're preparing the PhDs who are going to go on to be faculty, please teach them a little bit of pedagogy, and please give them a little data science. Because God willing, the, the future of teaching has to be something where faculty do something with students, they look at the data about how that went, they're able to translate what happened into what they should do pedagogically, and then they either go back into the classroom or they go online and they start that cycle again. They do something, students do something, that generates some data, and this skill of being able to translate the data about student performance into pedagogical implications, I think has got to be the key skill for faculty to have going forward if we want to see the kind of improvements in student outcomes that we all hope for. And that will be the nearly final word. I just want to thank everybody who's been on the panel today, David, Evie, and Tony. Uh, and thank you for listening. So thanks very much.
Thank you, Peter.